that you're alive, you're well, you're worthy of our praise, God. Hallelujah. They crucified him, but he's alive now. Hallelujah. Jesus.
you Lord. Lord, we don't see so much, so much that you've saved us from, so much that you've delivered us from. Lord, how much do we not even know about? But Lord, you brought us here today and you gave us a chance to lift up your name and to honor you, Lord, and to just set everything else aside and to just sit at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for just a minute and to just tell you how much we love you, God, how grateful we are. Lord, I pray that gratefulness just be the the tie in our hearts, Lord God, that we would just be so thankful for who you are. Sometimes we get wrapped up in our life and we forget to be thankful for how good you are, God. 
But Lord, I pray that this year, Lord, this time, Lord, we will be grateful for what you've done in our lives, Lord. I pray that depression be far from us, Lord, that oppression be far from us, Lord, and that gratefulness just be an ever-present thing in our hearts, Lord God, that we will not forget. Lord, that we'll remember, that we'll just put your word in our heart, Lord, and we'll remember to thank you for who you are, God, because you're worthy, Lord. I just thank you. I'm so grateful, God. So thankful for who you are in our lives, Lord. Thank you for what you do, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, we're grateful. forget, Lord. You're worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You're awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Imagine what an orphan feels like, though. Thinking about when we don't see much of it in America, but overseas you see a lot of orphanages. Imagine going to bed every night with a bunch of other kids, but laying down every night and wonder if there's anybody else out there that cares. Wondering if there's somebody out there that would want to be my father. Sure, I had a biological father and a biological mother, but you can be those things and not be a good mother and good father. But imagine an orphan out there. And uh, uh, compared to a son, a son or a daughter that had a good dad and it was a dad that invested and a dad that gave him authority to work and do those type of things. So today we want to talk a little bit about Sonship, what it's about. Because let me, let me tell you something. Until you, as a born again child of God, get comfortable in the love of the Father, then this church and no other church you have will ever do you any good. Until you come to the place in life that you realize that in Christ Jesus you are accepted in him. Then you will never know how to be loved by God. And you will never know how to love somebody else. Just believe me. I've been around this for a long time. I've watched people come in and I've watched people go out. And I've seen the different struggles and the different issues they got. Issues they got. But there comes a point in time in an individual's life when they feel so comfortable in a relationship with the Father. Because they know in Him they are totally accepted. And why shouldn't we be? God gave his only begotten son that he that believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If we would understand that, then we wouldn't waste most of our time out there chasing rabbits, chasing things that ultimately lead us into nothing. On the other hand, there are people who live their whole life in emptiness. Void. Always feel like they're lacking. And I wrote some of these things down. Isn't it amazing that some of us sit in the, the church 
a born-again child of God, but sitting in the church, you even feel like you're alienated from God. You, you feel like the God's the big man way upstairs, and somehow you feel distance in between him. And so sitting in the, the house of God, we got people that got that spirit on them. You could call it an orphan spirit that even though God resides with them, they feel distant to them. And you know how that is. We, we see that sometimes in marriage. Even though we're together and we, quote, love each other, we feel like there's a thousand miles in between between the different goals that we have with each other. So you know how it is, but check this out. A person with the orphan spirit are jealous at the success of other people. You ever been around somebody who just, when somebody else succeeds in life, they kind of roll their eyes, they kind of wonder what they did to be able to be blessed or succeed? Have you ever been around somebody who feels the need to be driven to succeed, to, to make it in life? Somebody with an orphan spirit feels the need, they're driven to succeed in life as if, if, if they succeed and they can finally reach this peak, then they can look around at the world and say, I finally made it. Somebody driven by that spirit use other people as stepping stones to get to where they want to be. They use people as objects. How sad is that? To use somebody else to take care of a need that you got when ultimately they can never fulfill the need you got, only God can. So you're just using them as a stepping stone till you get to the next place in your life. And sad thing about it is many of us are born again children of God and we don't have enough relationship with the Father to know that God's going to take care of me no matter what. We don't even have enough relationship with our Father to know He's got my back, He's got my future. So we use people to get what we want. And I'm telling you, that's why I refuse to manipulate you about money. That's why I refuse to manipulate you to get do things. I want people that love God so much that they want to be about doing things for the kingdom of God. Not because they get blessed, but they want to honor God. People with that spirit have a tendency to receive their primary identity through material possessions physical appearances and activities. And then one day you turn 50. Not only can you not do it, you can't even prove that you used to could do it. <laughs> then what are you going to do? I've been around long enough to know this. What was cool 10 years ago ain't cool today. So get what's cool today, but don't put your identity in it. Dress like you can dress today. Be what you need to be today. But please don't pit, you put yourself in it because when you do that, you're acting under an orphan spirit. You're acting like God ain't already give that to you. You're acting like that God don't have that for you. And the problem isn't that God hadn't already done that for you. The problem is we have so many blinders on us or within us. We can't, we can't accept reaching out and receiving the good things that God has for us because we have belief systems that so destroy everything we with God. See, and I can recognize these indications so easily because I was once deeply entrapped by these internal needs. Driven by, do you like me? Driven by, what, what can I do to get you to like me? Which was really driven by something even deeper, the, the fear of being alone. Probably for the first time in my life, my wife can go out of town and I'm cool. I can just sit there and watch TV. In the past, I couldn't stand it because I couldn't stand the silence of being alone. 
And my prayer is that on a scale of 1 to 10, D's getting closer to a 10, to reflecting the goodness of God. Uh, my prayer is that after 30 years, I'm not, still not hanging around on one or two in the ability to reflect the goodness of my Father. One day it'll be brought into completion. But my prayer is that I at least am marching towards that. I would, I would like to say I'm a nine and a half. But today I want to talk about sonship. What, what, what is it like to be a daughter of God? What is it like to be a son of God? The ultimate conclusion would be this. Jesus was the expressed image of God. And he was called the son of God. So the ultimate stage of sonship would be when somebody looks at you and somebody looks at me, they see the person of God. I'm almost God-ish in a sense. Not me as a person, but when a person sees me, they see God. That's what the word Christian is. I'm Christ-like. When they see you as an individual or they see me as an individual, they no longer see the person, Damon Plummer. They see, the, they see something different about them. They may not understand that it's Christian. They may not understand that it's godly. But they can look at you and see that there's something different than you in you rather than the same old stuff they see out in the world. Romans 8, 12 through 7. And by the way, that's not easy. If you think just being led by the Spirit and become a son of God in the sense other than the fact that I, ha I am a son of God and I'm becoming more and more like the son of God. If you don't understand, that ain't a process either. Let me, let me just share a little. I was talking to Rayford earlier. The, 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 the problem that the Pentecostal charismatic movement produced was this. They thought if you could just lay hands on somebody and impart to them some super duper anointing, then all of a sudden they would become something great. And they didn't realize that Jesus became and he grew in stature and wisdom. You can impart something to people all day long, but I still got to learn to grow. I've still got to become who I am in Christ. And that takes process of time. That takes the, the Holy Spirit working in my life. Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to, deeds, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For if you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Let me just stop there. If, if I have received the spirit of adoption, and we all have, I've been adopted into the family of God. Remember those songs? I'm so glad to be a part of the family of God. Join heirs with Jesus. I guess that's how it goes. Anyway, I knew that part of it. But look at me. If I have been adopted into the family of God, that means all of us at one time or another were orphans. We were alienated from God. So there's where I'm coming from, and let's keep on going to the passage. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If need be, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. In the first 11 verses, we started with verse 12 reading here. But in the first 11 verses of that passage, nine different times the word flesh was used. And 11 times the word spirit of God was used. These two, in reading this, you'll, you'll see that they seem to be in contrast to each other. One brings condemnation, the other brings approval. Not approval of our sin, but approval of who we are as individuals. One brings life and peace, the other brings sin and death. One pleases God and the other chooses to please themselves. 
Now, it's important for you to understand here, stand here today that there's never going to be a time in this life that you are able to overcome totally the flesh. As you grow closer to the Lord and you begin to reflect Him more and more, you'll, you'll reflect less and less the flesh. So what is the flesh? And we've talked about that a lot around here lately because I want to help us to understand that the flesh is not something good. The flesh is not our physical body here when it's talking about that. The flesh is that earthly nature of man. It's that what we inherited from Adam. Apart from God's divine influence working in my life. It's everything that we got from our forefathers. It's, it's belief systems that we got from people throughout the world and from originally back to the original father of all lies, Satan. It's all those beliefs, all those character traits, all those reasoning abilities. That is what we receive within ourselves, and that's what we call the flesh. It's the seed of our emotions. It's the seed of our reasoning abilities, and it's what gets us into a lot of trouble. Let me ask you something. What happens to a person if you get them out of a situation, but you do not change their beliefs? Huh? They go back in it. So if I keep taking this individual out of this situation, without a heart change in their heart and mind, they're going to go back and do the same thing again. So what God is told to do, you as a son, he has called you a son, but now he wants to take you and create you and make you into what he, he, he made you a son in that the spirit of God lives within you. Now he wants you to reflect everything that God's done on the inside, on the outside. So there's a process by which God has got to begin to change some things in your reasoning skills and your reasoning ability or you will never reflect who God is. Because why? What is reasoning? Reasoning is the ability to extract information from the previous knowledge and using it to solve new problems. What's the difficulty or what's the problem with extracting information from old things to try to fix new things? If the knowledge bank that I'm grabbing from the old is messed up, the new is going to be messed up always. So if I don't learn to allow the Spirit of God conform me into the image of Christ and I don't grow by the Word of God and I don't be learn to be led by the Spirit of God, then I'm going to continually be using my old ability to try to get new things in my life. It's kind of like this. I got a, I think it's a 300-foot measuring tape. I measure the bases with, measure slabs with, lay the patterns out and the footings out and all that business. Well, uh, on the end of that 300-foot tape, there's this metal thing with little teeth in it that when you lock it on the board, you can take off walking without it falling because it's locked in that board. So I'm walking along, and I'm at 30 foot, and I'm 60 foot, 70 foot, 80 foot, 90 foot, 100 foot here. And so because it's locked on right, I can mark 100 foot, and I can come back laying two foot on center back or 16 inches on center back. The problem is one day that little metal thing broke. <laughs> but being a tightwad like I was, instead of buying a new tape measure, I just took and tied a knot in the end of that tape measure. And I would get somebody and I'd say, I want you to hold that on the one foot mark. So I would drag that tape measure out to, to 100 foot. Can anybody tell me what the problem is if I drag that tape, foot, tape measure out to 100 foot? I'm always one foot short. So you always had to adjust to that. What's well, all good of 100 foot, but if you're like 100 foot, 6 inches and 3 eighths, and then your veins over here focusing on the 3 eighths and the 6, and you forget you got to add a, uh, you know, a 1 back to it. See, if I keep, if the, my tape measure is messed up, my measurement, it may look like 100, but it's always going to be messed up. And that is how it is when you use the flesh or your reasoning ability to keep doing the same old things in life. It takes the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God to change you into a son of God. If not, you will continually be led by the flesh. Get yourself in trouble. There's another thing called selective reasoning. And selective reasoning is the ability to extract information from, uh, from things that seem to be always favorable to you. <laughs> Think about that. You can be fighting your wife and always make the conversation be about you. 
Or worse than that, make it be about her. You know, if, if you would have done that, then I wouldn't have had this. So selective reasoning is the ability to blame everything on everybody else and make yourself always feel right. Instead of owning up and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to change in your life. And I've been there. I know that I, I will have to work through some of those issues in myself. The main problem with, with reasoning is when it comes to the things of God, we have been programmed for self-preservation. I mean, come on, guys. If you're a broken tape measure, you don't always like being wrong. So what you do is you create mechanisms to make yourself feel okay in the midst of being wrong. So God's Word comes in. So the Holy Spirit of God comes in to try to create you and make you into the image of, of, of God, in the image of Christ. But if I try to read back, reach back and try to do it on my own without the Holy Spirit, I'm using selective reasoning. And I can always make myself feel good. You know what I'm talking about. Hey, God should love me. I give money every Sunday. Well, what happens when you ain't got no money to give the next Sunday? Well, you know, you know what I'm saying? I worship passionately. Well, what happens when your arm's messed up and you can't worship today? Are you not a son? Are you, what, you, you see what I'm getting in? We use all these reasoning things in the church like somehow we're lack or not complete. Listen to me. I want you to get this. For a Christian, it is always a choice to be led by the spirit or the flesh. Listen to, listen to Brother Damon. You can mess up and blame it on somebody else if you want to. But it's always a choice. You either choose the spirit or you choose the flesh. You got that? Do y'all hear me? Just every day, Damon Plummer has made to make a choice. I'm going to be, make a choice to be led by the Spirit of God or a choice to be led by my own reasonings and my own ability. And if I do make the choice to be led by the flesh, the Scripture just told me it leads to death. For a Christian, it is a choice of being obedient to the Spirit or being obedient to your old reasoning skills that has got you nowhere through the years. Some of you have been using that same old, you've been put a new face on it, but it is the still same old problem that you've always done. See, it's the same old thing with the same old results. Or it can be good and get better. It can be a better marriage. Not the same old marriage, a better marriage. Raising better children. The children can be blessed more than you are because you have taught them how to be blessed and they're way ahead of the curve. They ain't got to go through the junk you go through. Everybody say, boy, I tell you what, I hope your kids don't reap what you did in life. My kids ain't under the junk that I've done. I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. My past has been redeemed. I have taught my children about the Word of God and what it means by the living God. So they ain't got to go back under the junk I did because I used, that's an unfair curse to put on somebody. I can get a better job. I can be a greater example. To the world around me. But imagine being free. But stuck. Imagine being free. But stuck. Look what verse 12 says in Romans 8. Therefore brethren. We are debtors not to the flesh. To live according to the flesh. What does it mean we're not debtors? The word debtor there. Means to be held by some obligation. Bound to some duty. Imagine being free, but somehow in the back of our mind, we feel obligated to stay in stuck. Imagine God has got all this for you, and Brother Rayford's getting it, and it's making you mad, because why should he get it? He's just a dumb redneck from Yazoo, Mississippi. Why is he getting it, but I'm stuck? Why do I feel obligated? Some of you feel obligated to be blessed because you, the same judgment you passed on people when you were young that were blessed. You're like, I wonder what they did to get that. Man. Now you're afraid to be blessed because you're afraid that those same people will look at you and wonder what you did. Right. 
self-deprivation. The feeling that others' happiness means is more important than your own. What has happened to some of us in our past and our reasoning abilities that you don't feel like that you can be blessed, that somehow if you're blessed, See, some of you stay in the same old thing you've been in for years. Same little housing area, doing the same old thing. Because somehow if you think you get blessed, you're better than them. No, you ain't. Just keep it in the realm. The Spirit of God has blessed me. Therefore, I can be a blessing to other people. It's all about a mindset. Some of you feel indebted to people. I, I've counseled people that have been molested by family members. And they're, they're almost best friends. Because somehow they feel indebted to their captors. They feel indebted to that. Instead of breaking free from it. Same thing with people on coming off of drugs. I've, I've seen it. It's kind of like they can't let people know they're free because they, then somehow mentally, if I do this, then somehow they think that I think that I'm better than them. Well, why do we want to live underneath that? See, this becomes a breeding ground for resentment. I resent them from I'm being in this situation. I resent myself that I believed the lie the whole time. I become indebted to my reasoning skills instead of knowing what God has done for me and that it's okay to be blessed and it's okay to live the blessed life because it never was about me in the first place. It's always been about the person of Jesus Christ. It is us choosing our destiny using false information. It's me trying to exceed. See, look at me. The average person who wins the lottery, millions of dollars are broke within 10 years. You can give people money, 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 but until they change their spending habits and spending beliefs, they're going to get themselves in trouble. What do we do? We just keep bailing people out. Romans 8, 27 says, Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit. The, there's a person searching your heart and knows what the goal of the Spirit of God is in your life. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit of God is bringing you from an orphan to sonship. And he's working. And it's difficult and it's hard. But he loves you enough to help you change your mindsets where you won't keep staying into the same situation. So it's a choice. Number two, the flesh and the spirit, one leads to life, the other leads to death. Verse 13 says it like this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will live. Did I leave something out there? We have some responsibility in this. The Spirit of God is there, but it's important for us to put to death the deeds of the body. The Holy Spirit of God's there. The Holy Spirit's empowering you. The Holy Spirit's giving you grace. But it is up to you to make that choice in life because God is trying to change the mindsets. If you can learn to change the mindset, then you will learn the joy of getting through that situation. What does it mean, deeds? Deeds. I was talking to somebody and they were trying to convince me that everything's good deeds. And I said, so there ain't no bad deeds? Yeah, but we think of good, well, I get you. There's deeds all over the place. But there can be some bad deeds. How many of y'all had some bad deeds done to you? But check this out. The word deeds is a doing, a mode of acting, a deed, an act, a transaction. Look what he said here. 
by the Spirit of God, you must take those transactions, those ways you've been acting for all these years, by the Holy Spirit, put it to death, and then you shall live. If you do not put those deeds to death, your body will always react. How do I know? You ever taken somebody who's maybe bound on crack or messed up crystal meth or marijuana or you name it, cigarettes, I don't know, alcohol, whatever. You ever taken them and locked them up in jail? After the first day, everything's kind of cool. The second day, they're starting to sweat and they're starting to shake because you know what? The body's saying, I need something. But isn't it amazing after being in jail for a little bit how they can get through that addiction? Isn't it amazing how you can get through it? So imagine if the Holy Spirit would empower us to overcome those reasoning abilities that we've been using. Allow the Holy Spirit by the, uh, the Word of God change my belief systems that keeps getting me into the same situation. In fact, that it's got your grandmama in the situation and you in the situation. Your mama, your grandmother, and your great-grandmother have been in the same situation through the year and you're wondering why you're here. It is time for a mental change. Hallelujah. It is time for the Holy Spirit of God to come in and begin to let you know some like it or not baby we are moving from an orphan to a son of God so buckle down baby it's time to roll on with it well what I what I'm, we're talking about putting the deeds of the body to death do you know that looking at pornography you can look at it and instantaneously a chemicals let loose in your body that makes your body react What if we would learn to say, nope, not going there. Put it to death. What about those self-judgments we put on people? What if when it come up, if you don't know for it to be the fact, and then you don't even know why, you, just, you don't even know why they may do it, and you just stop and don't put no judgment on people. What if you just said, nope, ain't my business to judge it. Ain't my business. They come talk to me about it. I'll tell them God, biblical truth. But I'm not getting into all that with them. People try to get me as a pastor to get into all the time. I say, uh-uh. Because one of y'all going to leave here mad. Man. You didn't kill the deeds of the body. Then you deal with the consequences of it. And I'll love you in the midst of it. And when you come out through the other side, we'll high five each other and make it. Number three, make the choice of life. Make the choice of life. The whole point I'm wanting to make today is the spirit-led life is the way to sonship. The spirit-led life is the way that I begin to reflect God more and more. Don't this old world need that more? Don't this old world need to see the reflection of God in our life? See, the spirit of sonship, let me, let me read verse 14 and then we get back. The spirit of sonship says this, for as many that are led by the spirit of God, these are the what? The sons of God. Now I'm going to talk about a few things, then we're going to see what the word led is, and then we're out of here, okay? The spirit of sonship functions out of love and acceptance for others. You could say it like this. Oh, Hillary said, America's a bunch of deplorables and irredeemables. Let me tell you like this. Most folks think that we're a bunch of deplorables and irredeemables. There's some folks that won't allow their kids to come down here because some of the kids that come down here, mom and daddy do drugs. What do you think they do at South Panola? Or Pope or anything else? Really? Come on, really? We're going to... Hosanna, it's the best situation you can raise your kid in. At Hosanna, it's going to be a controlled environment, but you're going to see just about anything that possibly can be seen. Come on. <laughs> Amen. Without being too cruel, you can say, you see that kid? Bruce Wilkes is his grandfather, and look at him. <laughs> he ain't got no hair. That's what happens. 
Now, you see them getting in. Hosanna is a great environment for you to raise your children. You know what? We got children that don't have no mamas. We got children that don't have no daddies. We got all this stuff, and we're teaching them how to make it. And hallelujah, you get to sit in this environment and learn through and work through, and you get to see God in action, and that's what it's all about. Instead of being raised in a, a, an area or a society to think that there's no wrong at that church. Really? See, the, the mature son is committed to the success of his brothers and sisters. A mature person wants you to be, they want you to make it. Even if you make it before I do. I'm, awesome, I'm glad you did it. An orphan gets. I've been praying all week and I didn't get nothing. They come in here willy nilly and Lord just touches them. <laughs> Spirit orphan doesn't recognize that he's already complete. He's already a son. And God's got my back and he knows just where I'm headed and where I need to go and he got it all for me. He knows that I'm preparing. God's preparing me. A mature son serves God out of sense of divine acceptance and favor. A mature son serves people to bless the kingdom. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the unrighteous. Sitting here at the door and smiling and you're shaking your hand is a big deal waving you on to send you to the back to park and help you come in that's a man that's an honor working a camera and working computers to make it easy on people build. it is man sign me up the spirit of sonship rests in their father's ability to control and guide your future you don't get mad if you don't get the things that you want at the time you get it the spirit of sonship knows that my father has got my back the scripture says the spirit of God will take care of me The spirit of sonship is grounded in sonship and the father's affirmation. Take it from somebody who lived his whole life trying to get the, play, the happiness from other people. If you ever get a touch of the father's love, it is so sweet and it is so good. And that's how come when I hear, he's a good, good father. It's who you are who you are and I'm loved by you that's who I am and you are perfect in all of your ways it rests in his goodness the spirit of sonship is grounded in the father's affirmation verse 14 for as many who are led by the spirit of God these are the sons of God I'm getting ready to close out The word led is the hard word. How many of y'all ever, ever went to the mountains and rode the horses? How many of y'all ever done it? You can sit on that horse and cross your arms. You know why? Because that horse has done, took that journey so many times. It's kind of like, why am I riding on this dumb horse? You know, that horse goes up here, gets to this cliff, and he'll turn this way. You know, you ain't even steer him. He just, he just, he's gotten so accustomed to being led. He just, you know, it's just like... That horse just does it. You ain't even got to turn it. He's so used to being led by he's doing his own thing. But have you ever got on a horse that ain't quite broken like that? You turn that way and he goes that way. You're trying to stop and he puts his head down and you go forward. Being led's a difficult word. Being led means to lead by influence, by effecting the mind. 
So I have these reasoning skills and being led by the Spirit. The Spirit's coming up and trying to come against those reasoning skills or try to help you change those reasoning skills. And it's where we get the word, Greek word, agonize. It is agonizing to be led by the Spirit of God, but it's healthy. You know what I'm talking about. Spirit of God says, do this, but it's agonizing. Agony inside of it is just, it goes and against everything that you've been taught. It's where we get the word brought. Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin. You're being brought into sonship, kicking and screaming. And God is just trying to change some things, some insecurities. It, 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 I used to tell people all the time, do you really, you know, bro, if God blesses you anymore, you're going to go to jail. <laughs> what do you mean? You ain't paying your taxes. You don't pay your taxes sooner or later. If you got enough 1099s backed up on you, guess what? They're going to come knocking at your door. So stop. Get your stuff in order or you're going to get yourself in trouble. And you're crying for blessing. And the Lord said, I just want you to change some mindsets. It's intense conflict. Such a struggle is a wrestling match. Struggling with your human will. It's agonizing. It's the, it's the will to want to do it my way rather than God's way. There's no way about it, guys. If you want to be led by the Spirit of God, it is tough. But at least it'll be led to life. Doing my way, the same old way, doing the same old things, you know as well as I know, leads to death. Don't you? Don't you? doing the same old thing you're always doing in the same old situation wondering where God is the difficult thing that you as a, an adult sometimes and I as a pastor and a father is how deep do we allow them to go before we step in that's the difficult thing ain't it because you know what we get our identity from our kids instead of from our father. Years ago in the ministry, my wife would say, you make, when you do that, it makes me look bad. Getting our identity by the way her husband performed. Some of you need to let your husband go and fall off the rock cliff, baby. And maybe when he gets up and hits the bottom, he'll do right. I mean, I'm just telling you. Uh-oh, that was a bad one. Let me get on to Romans chapter 18. <laughs> Two scriptures and read out, then we're closing. I just want to be a son, to be honest with you. I just want to reflect the love of the Father. It's all good. He has nothing bad for us. He has nothing but good for us. And if you think falling on the ground and kicking your feet and holding your breath is hurting God, God's just like, dude... <laughs> Whatever, just keep on. <laughs> you ever seen kids do that? Mine never did that. But I had walked up, getting it off, turning blue, and I'm like, oh, my God. Kick him. He's okay. Ah, oh, he'll be okay. I'm like, <laughs> Romans 8, 18 and 19. Then a couple of scriptures. Try not to do no commentary, and we're out of here. This is the same chapter, but towards the end of the chapter and kind of a conclusion. Look what he says. For I consider that the sufferings, suffering is just simply pressures, that agonizing. For I consider that the pressures and agonizing of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Who, if I'm a reflection, who's the glory? Nothing will compare to when they see Jesus in me. For the earnest expectation of creation, which is us, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. People all around are waiting for you and for me to stop being led by our reasoning abilities and led by God. 
Now, it may not look all cool to everybody else, but somebody's always looking and say, wow, you sure handled yourself in that situation pretty good. I'd have throat punched them. How'd you do that? I did it by my God in me because I wanted to throat punch them too. In fact, if I went to the doctor, they'd probably give me bipolar medicine because down deep I wanted to punch them out. But I've learned to trust the Holy Spirit other than my reasonings. And honestly, that's why some of you are in shape you're in. You're so fighting against your reasonability instead of one day just submitting to the Spirit of God. Just, just get enough of it. Because sooner or later, your reasoning skill is going to cause you so much pain. And until it does, you're going to keep doing the same thing. Romans 8, 26 through 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, when you're in agonizing pain. You ever seen somebody in agony pain? Oh, oh I've had pancreatitis hit me. Kidney stone is like, oh. Kind of like Bruce Lee. Whoa. Whoa. That thing moves. Oh. Check this out. You think it's funny. Agonizing causes of pain. But look what he says here. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For when we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Should I stay or should I go? The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, we know that's not the Holy Spirit groaning because he don't have to groan and utter because he already knows the Holy Spirit falls along the side of our groanings and our utterances. And he makes intercession for us. Look what it says. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He knows what's really going on in you. He knows it's internally going on. And if you would but submit to God, he'll come along the side of. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And he knows what's going on in your heart and mind. And he wants to just pick you up and intercede in your weakness, in your inability to make a decision, in your inability to do this thing. My Father, he's not doing it to punish you. He's not, oh, Rayford's had a bad attitude today. I'm going to get you. He's saying, Brother Rayford's struggling today. I want to come along the side of him. And as he's agonizing, he intercedes for him. Father, Jesus died that he can be blessed. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he was tempted in all ways like ourselves. And young people, listen to Brother D. You can go on and be led by your reasoning skills if you want to. Okay? Go do it if you want to. But there come a day that you're so agonizing because of it, you're going to find yourself in trouble. My encouragement would be learn to be a spirit-led at a young age. That way he can bring life at a young age. Instead of so much pain. I want to see my girls and my children be live a life that brings life, not death. And as a pastor, listen to me. By the grace of God, I will not manipulate you. I will not use the word to beat you down. But by the grace of God, I'll teach you the truth the way it is and the truth to help you grow. And if I don't do that, I have folks around here to bring me on the carpet about it. Already, but I'm going to teach you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth in your face. And I hope you do it. I hope I'm, I'm learning to be a good father in this earthly realm to help you grow. That's a promise I make to you. You let the Spirit of God help you grow and know that he wants to bring you to life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you. Father, I thank you for your people. Oh, God, I know 30 years it's been agonizing. 
Sometimes it's being taken up for myself when I feel like I'm backed into a corner. Insecurities of life. But in all of that, you have been my father. So I'm not doing this altar call in a sense to make a person feel bad. I'm doing this altar call because where if any two of us or three of us are gathered together in your name, then you are in our midst. And some of the people here today, they need a faith lift to Lord God. They need somebody to agree with them that when they leave this place, they'll know that it's all going to be good. And they can rest in you.